I'm going to be talking about the research that I did while I was at University of Florida, um, the research I did for my master's degree on culturing grasses. So before I start, I wanted to mention all of the organizations and the people that made this project possible. Um, these people have done everything from fund my research, um, like the Rising Tide, um, donate food, donate brood stock, um, food, really anything. So this project wouldn't have happened um, without these people. And if you're unfamiliar with the Tropical Aquaculture Lab in Florida, um, it's not at the main campus in Gainesville. It's actually located in a little town called Ruskin um, on Tampa Bay. And this is what the farm looks like from overhead. Um, most of these ponds are for freshwater ornamental um, aquaculture and research, but there are some little hidden places where we do our marine work. So in this last greenhouse, that's where we hold all of our uh, marine brood stock. And in here, this is where we do the larval rearing. This little building is our quarantine facility. And in the corner of that building, that's where we grow all of our um, copepods and produce our live microalgae. So Rasses in the family Labradae, it's one of the largest families of fish, uh, second largest marine family under gobies. And they're highly varied. They're not all the, the pretty ornamental fish that we know. Um, some of them are actually cold water. Like the tatog, you can find that up and down the east coast of the US. Or the ballenrass, which is found in northern Europe. And that's actually cultured um, to control ectoparasites on the salmonids that are grown out in cages there. But of course, we have all of the colorful wrasses that we know and love, and we um, have in our aquariums. So there's a large um, size variation in wrasses as well. The minute wrass um, is as small as six centimeters, and then we have the Napoleon wrass, which can be bigger than we are. And a lot of wrasses um, perform some really key ecological functions as well, like the Blue Street Cleaner Wrasse and the Juvenile Spanish Hogfish. Um, they perform cleaning services for various fish on reefs, so they're also very important. And of course, we love wrasses because they're really colorful, um, diverse in their coloration and their patterns. So this is... Um, a graph from Andy Ryan's research in 2012. And this gives you an idea of what families of fish and what volume are coming into the US. So most of what's coming in are the damsels and clownfish in the Palmacentridae family. The third highest are the angels, the palmacanthids. Then gobies, acanthurids, the tangs and surgeons. And the second most imported by volume are the wrasses. And you can see over on the side that the wrasses actually have the highest number of species imported into the US. So this is a very popular family of fish for the aquarium trade. But out of 548 species of wrasse, only 10 of those have been cultured before, many of those just a one-time one -time deal. And only five of those are ornamental. So there is a lot of room for research and improvement in culture methods for, um, for wrasses. These are the 10 species that have been cultured, and you can probably tell which ones are the ornamentals, <laughs> the ones on the right. Um, the only one in commercial production, like I mentioned before, is the ball and wrasse. Um, so there's many culture challenges or bottlenecks that are associated with raising these fish. A lot of these are true for um, demersal and pelagic spawners, but kind of more so for the pelagic spawners like the wrasses. Uh, development of broodstock is really the foundation of the whole process, and a lot of the diets that we use um, haven't really been backed up by specific research yet, so we're kind of basing it on um, marine food fish diets right now. So they might not be as specialized as they, um, they need to be. The pelagic spawning embryos are usually extremely small. Um, you can see 
Over here, um, these are Melanuris brass eggs, and they're about 600 microns in diameter, so a little over half a millimeter. And when they hatch, they're only about um, 1.6 mil millimeters long. And they're extremely underdeveloped as well. Um, they don't have eyes or a mouth or a digestive tract at this point. They're kind of just a floating notochord with a big yolk sac. And it takes them a couple days to actually begin feeding. Um, first feeding is uh, the first major bottleneck for these types of fish. Um, they tend to have very small mouths and um, a lot of times cannot ingest a lot of the live feeds that are more commonly produced, like rotifers and artemia. Most of the time they'll require something smaller like copepodnoplii or even ciliates. Environment, environmental parameters tend to be very species specific and really impact survival and first feeding. So things like turbidity and light intensity really play an important role. And the characteristics of the prey, um, such as how they move and act in the environment, can elicit different feeding responses. Um, and density is also very important as well, so they can get the maximum amount of nutrition for the least amount of energy. And other key developmental milestones that um, are usually associated with high mortality are swim bladder inflation which is when the larvae will go up to the surface of the water and gulp air and force it down into their swim bladder. And that's, that helps them to maintain buoyancy and um, reduce energy expenditure when they're searching for food. Um, flexion is the time period when they begin to develop their caudal fin. So the tip of their notochord will start to lift and the hyperal plates will start to form. And this is a very energetically taxing period in their development that's usually associated with high mortality. And metamorphosis is when um, they kind of morph into um, a miniature version of what they'll look like as adults. So we decided to choose um, two rat species in the Helicores genus for my research. One, because they're really popular in the aquarium industry, so we wanted to work on something that um, people would be interested in purchasing um, if it does get to commercial production. And they also have a very short larval duration compared to most other RAS um, genera. So averaging around 26 and a half days. And you can see over here, um, most of those species um, fall within the 20 to 30 day mark. Um, which is pretty short compared to something like a thalassoma, which um, their larval durations um, can range from about 45 up to 90 days. So that is probably something that um, won't really be commercially viable anytime in the near future unless technology um, really improves. And it's also the largest RAS genus, so potentially methods that were developed for uh, the Melanuris RAS or the Yellow RAS could be applied to uh, many other RAS in the same genus that are popular in the aquarium industry. So the, the two species that I focused on for my research are the Melanuris and the Yellow RAS, but for the purposes of time, I'm just gonna focus on the Melanuris because we um, made some really important um, advances with that species. And the overall objectives for my research were to develop culture techniques for the yellow wrasse and the melanurus wrasse, focusing on everything starting from broodstock husbandry and management, spawning characteristics, embryo incubation temperature, improvement of larvae culture methods, which includes looking at parameters like algal density, shading method, prey type, and prey density. So a lot to fit in in two years. Um, most of you are probably familiar with the Melanaris wrasse, but it's found widespread through the Western Pacific. It's in the top 20 most imported wrasse species, and in 2008 and 9, about 4,000 were imported into the U.S. in those years, and in 2011, it jumped up to around 12,000. Um, we don't have more recent data for that, but it seems like it's um, gaining popularity. Uh, maximum length is about 12 centimeters, so it's a good size for most uh, medium-sized aquaria. Price point ranges from around $30 to $100, depending on the size of the individual and the coloration that it has. So something like um, the Melanaris up here, that's a big terminal male, so that'll probably be at the higher end of the price point. 
They have a relatively short larval duration um, in the wild, around 22 days. And it was first successfully cultured in 2015 at the Tropical Aquaculture Lab by Kevin Barton. So like most wrasses, they're protogenous hermaphrodites, meaning that they start out as female and according to um, social and environmental parameters, um, they, can they can transition into a male. And you can gauge their sex um, based on the number of dorsal ocelli that they have. So at the top, um, this is a female and you can see there's three um, kind of eye spot looking markings on the dorsal fin. So that means it's a female. And then as it starts to transition, it loses those dorsal ocelli from front to back. So the fish in the middle is kind of mid-transition, so it's either a large female or a smaller male. And then the fish at the bottom, that's a large terminal male because um, it has no dorsal spots and it has that um, distinctive pink facial barring and um, yellow coloration around the pectoral fins. When it came to quarantine, initially we were trying to um, prophylactically treat these fish with antibiotics because in the past they had had some um, bacterial issues, but we found that we had very poor survival through our 30-day quarantine period when we tried this, um, this procedure. The good thing is that they seem to be pretty resistant to external parasites. We never had any issues with our wrasses um, in the two years I was there, and it's probably because of their uh, robust mucus layer that they have. So what we ended up settling on as a um, procedure for quarantine is kind of a less is more mentality, where we just maintain um, the highest water quality that we can and feed them a varied um, high quality diet and that really um, improved larval survival or um, broodstock survival. When it comes to setting up harems, um, we found out pretty quickly what didn't work with these fish. Um, mixing individuals uh, like males and females from different groups that we brought through quarantine never resulted in viable spawning. But what did work was starting with many small females and even juveniles and letting them grow up together in the same tank and letting the largest, most dominant females establish themselves and become males and um, then we would have some pretty good spawning for the months following that period. And we would observe this sex change as early as two weeks. So we would keep most of our brood stock in large 700 gallon fiberglass tanks like in the top right. Um, it's very important for these fish to have uh, cover on your tanks because they tend to jump. Um, you can see our egg collection method here. Um, it's a passive overflow system into a screen bucket. Pretty simple, but it works really well. As for diet, we fed them five times a day, a um, variety of pellets, pea, mysis, fertility, LRS fertility frenzy, and fish roe kind of cover all of our nutritional bases. And other things really important for these wrasses are structure. Um, so either PVC tunnels or fake coral pieces to um, provide areas for them to hide if need be. And sand is also really important for these guys. They like to sleep in the sand. They'll actually bury themselves in the sand um, at night. And if they feel threatened during the day or need to escape from other aggressive individuals, um, they'll also bury themselves. So we would provide what we call sandboxes um, for each of our broodstock tanks. So this is the spawning that we observed for one particular um, group of Melanuris. Started out as having one male and 13 females. It took them a little while to um, start getting some larger viable spawns, um, but around Two points, uh, these, are, these represent full, the full moon cycle. Um, we did see some peaks around a couple of the full moon, so there's a potential for some lunar periodicity to be going on, um, especially if uh, this group was monitored for a longer period of time. Uh, so one of the first things I did uh, was do a larval growth and development study with these fish. So I wanted to pinpoint when they were going through certain developmental periods that are associated with high mortality. 
So I stocked a single spawn in this 125 liter uh, round tank and sampled larvae daily throughout their developmental period, measuring their notochord length before they go through flexion and standard length after they go through flexion. And these are the water quality parameters that were maintained. So the feeding regime that um, we used for this period was we used tetracelmus algae throughout their pelagic larval duration until they settled. We used Parvocalinus crassirostris um, nopoli, um, different sizes as they grew. Weaned them onto Artemia and then finally a commercial um, top dressed otohime pellet diet after they went through settlement. And we made sure to overlap all of these different food items a fair amount because we weren't sure exactly when they were transitioning from one to the other. So this is the larval duration that um, we recorded for this particular group. These are some late stage embryos that are on the, the verge of hatching. Um, you saw this picture before, but this is the newly hatched larvae that hasn't started feeding yet. This is a one day old uh, larvae that has used up a significant portion of their yolk sac and oil globule and their eyes are just starting to develop, but they're not pigmented yet, so they're, they're not feeding quite yet. Um, at three days post-hatch, their eyes are fully pigmented. They have an open mouth and a um, functional digestive tract. And you can actually see there's some food particles in their gut. So this is when they um, first began feeding. At seven days post-hatch, the larvae has grown in size and their gut has increased in complexity. And then at 11 days post-hatch, this is the first day that I saw a larvae with an inflated swim bladder. It's that a little illuminated bubble right there. Initiation of flexion, I first saw this um, around two weeks of age. And you can see the very tip of the notochord is starting to lift up and those hyperole plates are starting to form. Completion of flexion around 18 days. Um, and that's when those hyperol plates have started to surpass the notochord tip. Uh, first saw metamorphosis at 37 days. And about a week later, um, they've increased their uh, classic melanurus ras pigmentation. And you might be wondering why I don't have a picture for settlement for these guys. And that's because um, when these guys settle, they actually bury themselves in the sand in a similar manner to the behavior of the adults. So they'll go into the sand looking like this clear larval individual at the top, and they'll stay in the sand for a couple days as they go through metamorphosis. And then they'll, they'll pop out and start, start swimming around, and they'll look like a little mini Melanurus ras. So it's, it's pretty cool behavior that um, Frank Banch also saw when he raised the ornate wrasse, which is in the same genus. This is the larval growth that I observed over this, um, this developmental period, um, kind of marking out when they went through these different development, developmental milestones. Uh, for this run, I got about half a percent survival and 17 juveniles, so that was a vast improvement from the, the previous trials. And from that, we were able to produce a first generation of Melanaris wrasses that completed metamorphosis around the same time, 35 days. Survival was about 0.4%. Uh, and at about eight months of age, we noticed um, one of the females was starting to look a little plump. Um, so we put an egg collector in there, and the next day we got fertilized embryos. Um, so it's possible that these fish can reach sexual maturity within eight months of time, which is um, a pretty short amount of time. And it really um, shows the potential of this fish for domestication and commercial production. This is the spawning data that I collected for uh, about four months' time. Um, again, there's really no indication of lunar periodicity at this point, but if data was collected for a longer period of time, um, that could be a possibility. Um, average spawn size was about 1,200 uh, fertilized eggs, and so fertilization success was pretty high, around 85%. 
And from those fish, we were able to produce a couple of second generation groups of Melanaris wrasse. They completed metamorphosis a little bit later, around 40 days. Uh, survival percentage still around that half a percent mark. Um, and around six months of age, they were about uh, 3.4 to 4.5 centimeters. So we were able to close the life cycle of the Melanaris wrasse, which uh, we believe is a first for um, uh, an ornamental wrasse species. So it's pretty exciting. So now I'm gonna go into some of the experiments that I ran, um, the egg incubation experiments and the larval rearing experiments. Uh, the larval culture studies were conducted in this room over here in these uh, smaller 13 liter tanks so we could do uh, replicated studies. And we did a couple experiments uh, before they started feeding, so the morning of three days post-hatch. And then we also did some first feeding studies um, during that, um, that three days after hatching, looking at uh, effects of algal density, prey density, and um, prey type on their feeding success. So for the incubation studies, we looked at three temperatures that were all within the natural range of the species. And we placed one um, fertilized embryo into each of these microplate wells so we could monitor the hatch rate over time. And we, we did this study to make sure that we can increase the survival up until the hatching point and um, possibly increase the size of the larvae at hatching. So the data that we collected from this uh, what we're looking for is um, a shorter hatching period. When hatching tends to be drawn out over time, um, tends to indicate that it's not the right temperature. We're looking for a high percent hatch and we're looking for um, pretty tight data among the replicates. So it seems like the, the 25 degrees C seems to be the, the best option um, and it produced about 80% um, hatch rate. Um, when we looked at the effect of temperature on notochord length, we found that the 22 degree temperature um, resulted in a slightly larger larvae at hatch. And this is mainly due to the fact that their, um, their metabolic rate is slower and it takes them longer to hatch, so they're spending more time developing within that egg. And this could potentially um, be an advantage because if they're slightly larger when they hatch, they could potentially eat slightly larger food items, um, which could um, impact survival. Um, but what we found was, um, when we looked at the effect of temperature on survival, um, the colder temperature drastically decreased the survival, so that's not really a viable option, unfortunately. Um, but if we look at the, the two studies side by side, it looks like uh, 25 degrees C will result in um, slightly larger larvae and also give you a really good um, percent survival. So now we're going to go on to the larval culture studies that were done in those smaller 13 liter tanks. And just to give you an idea of how small these larvae are, um, this is a three day post hatch uh, Melanaris larvae and this is a one inch standpipe. And if you can see these little black pieces of they're just so, so small. Um, those are the larvae. Uh, we used tetracelmus algae throughout these trials and we stocked 150 eggs in each tank. So we looked at the effect of algal density on larval survival up until the point when they would start feeding to kind of maximize the number of larvae we can have for that first bottleneck. And we'd be adding algae at this point mainly to decrease light intensity because they're not actually feeding yet. And the treatments that we used um, ranged from no algae up to a density of 200,000 cells per milliliter. And what we found was that no algae did not go well for these fish. Um, they really liked having any algae in the tank. But we wanted to look at this further and see if it was the actual algae increasing the survival or if it was in fact the um, decrease in light intensity because we had seen these larvae were pretty light sensitive in the past. 
So then we did a shading method study um, up until the point when they would start feeding. And we were shading the tank to decrease light intensity, of course, but also um, it was the potential to conserve algae resources and to maintain a higher water quality. Because whenever you're adding microalgae to your culture tank, you're also introducing the nutrients that was used to grow the algae and um, any algal cells that die and settle to the bottom, that's going to um, decrease your water quality and affect your larval survival. So we looked at three treatments. Two of them resulted in the same light intensity, but one of them was shaded with algae, like in the previous study, and one was shaded with window screening. And then the third one was completely blacked out. So when we looked at the results of this study, we found that there was no difference among the treatments. So this indicates that they are very light sensitive and the previous increase in survival was actually due to the lower light intensity and probably not necessarily the algae itself. Um, and then when we look at the effect of the shading on the notochord length, um, we see that they did not like being in complete darkness. So there's definitely um, an area where they like a little bit of light but not too much light and um, so we need to figure out exactly where that lies. So then we looked at um, some feeding studies, um, first looking at um, algal density because um, adding algal um, algae to larval tanks has been shown to increase contrast in the water column between the prey items and the background, allowing them to better visualize prey items and increase feeding uh, percentage. So we used the Parvocalinus nauplii at uh, five per mil, and we had three treatments ranging from 100,000 cells to 300,000 cells, or to 500,000 cells per mil. And what we found was they liked algal densities a little bit on the higher side, um, 300,000 to 500,000 per mil. And based on that, we'd recommend the middle density so you can conserve some resources and um, maintain your water quality a little bit better. And then we did a prey type study comparing um, first feeding um, on copepods versus rotifers. Because rotifers are really the, the popular method of feeding right now. They're much easier to culture at high densities and much cheaper at this point but we wanted to see if there was a difference in feeding if we gave them these two, um, these two options. So uh, we sampled these larvae at two time points after we added feed that morning that they started feeding. And we didn't find any difference between the two time periods, but feeding ranged around uh, 35 to 39 percent. And uh, the replicates that had rotifers in them, they did not like that. Um, we didn't find any larvae that ate rotifers, so this either indicates rotifers are a little bit too big for them or they're not eliciting that feeding response or perhaps there's some other environmental parameters that are preventing them from feeding. But it seems like the copepods are definitely the way to go for first feeding for these fish. Um, and then we looked at prey density um, using the Parvocalinus nauplii. Uh, algal density was about 300,000 cells per mil, and we looked at treatments of two and a half, five, and ten per mil. And what we found was that they preferred the um, the higher densities, um, so we'd recommend probably five um, prey items per mil to um, conserve resources. So overall summary for Melanuris wrasse is we were able to um, develop a quarantine protocol that increased survival, um, broodstock husbandry techniques, embryo incubation temperatures, larval culture conditions before first feeding, and culture conditions during first feeding. We were able to evaluate um, spawning characteristics, described their full larval development, determined the approximate time to sexual maturity, and completed the life cycle. So this species was extremely successful. And there's always a lot of other research that can be done with these fish. Um, I'd really love the results that I got for the experiments to be applied to um, future culture studies, which is actually what, what Grace is doing now at the lab. 
um, um, it's really important to uh, reduce mortality during those other environmental, um, other developmental milestones like the swim bladder inflation and flexion. So those need to be examined further. As for feeding, at what point can we transition them onto rotifers and artemia? Because the sooner we can do that, the more economical this protocol is going to be and the more likely it is that they're going to be put into commercial production. Uh, we can look at other things like prey density later on in development, feeding frequency, flow rate, algal density, light intensity, and an infinite number of other things that you can look at to um, improve this uh, culture protocol. And ultimate application of this research is to hopefully develop commercial protocols for the Melanuris RAS, but also it sets the foundation for the culture of other grasses in the Halicorius genus or perhaps outside of that genus, and guide research for, um, all, for many other marine ornamental species. So again, I'd like to mention all of these people and companies that uh, made this research possible. Everyone at the Tropical Aquaculture Lab who helped out, um, the family and my friends, and my advisory committee. And with that, I'll take any questions that you might have.